Tim Bullock, you are one of the perennial walkers. That's right. So, uh, where have you been? You said you started in Seabrook? This walk started on March 2nd at Seabrook uh, after an initial walk in Leverett where we walked from the pagoda to the town hall three miles. We jumped in automobiles to make our official beginning at the Seabrook Nuclear Power Plant and uh, we had a program there at the Seabrook Public Library that kicked us off. We were down through Ipswich on through Salem down to Boston where we were there for two days went to the governor's office the attorney general's office on down to through many of the communities in the South Shore was in Plymouth on the 11th the anniversary of Fukushima and then we started heading west uh, through Dartmouth our friend Eric Wazileski hosted us down there and then we we're here we are on our way to Vernon uh, where we'll end the walk on the 21st. So Tim, I understand you are, you're probably the primary organizer of this. Yes, walk. I am. Yeah. So you said you've been on this walk for four months because <laughs> you had a lot of work before yeah. one foot went down. Yeah. It usually take you know a few months, maybe three months to you know by the time you plan it all out, plan your route, build your your program because you have to get the flyers out, the brochures, and they have to you know list where you're going. And all of this is temporary because you know as as you're trying to plan it, things happen and things don't happen that you have in mind. And so uh, yeah, it's probably around Christmas that we knew what the route was going to be and had the brochure. And now it's time to contact all those people in those communities, get them set up to receive 15 to 20 people to provide food and shelter. So it's been quite a quite a journey. You know, the journey just didn't start on the second. It started a few months before. So, Tim, you've been involved with this walking order of, of Buddhist monks and nuns for a long time. How long have you been walking? I've been walking. This is probably my 15th year. Wow, it doesn't seem that long. Well, maybe 14. It started back in 1998. Um, a walk that took a year and two weeks to complete. We started in Leverett and ended up in Cape Town, South Africa. And if you think that's, you know, wow, all the way to Africa, it was a life-changing experience that really put me on this path. And this is where I am because I realized the importance of connecting communities communities, the importance of sharing stories, and how transforming sharing your stories with lots of communities can be. And so that's what we're going to be doing a little of tonight, that's right. sharing of these stories. So thanks, Tim, and I'll be back to you before the walk is over. Thank you, Saki. Glad to be here. This morning we drove to Seabrook, New Hampshire, um, and we got our first lesson in, we got our first lesson in the economics of nuclear power when we got to stay, got to use a palatial public library. I live in a town where the library roof has leaked for 10 years and we can't afford to fix it. But when you live in a town with a nuclear uh, reactor, you get a really nice library. <laughs> um, along with everything else. Um, I won't go into great detail about where we, where all the places we went, but we heard a pa at the library that night. We heard a panel of experts of people who uh, have been working on this issue for some of them 30 years, and their knowledge and expertise was extraordinary and increased my knowledge manyfold. Um, we traveled down the North Shore. And every night we were hosted by, you know, uni Unitarian churches or friends, uh, Quakers, and had evening programs. They were all interested in what we were doing and what we uh, had to say. But also it came back to us. We were very interested in knowing what they were doing in their communities and what was going on. And I hope that happens here tonight as well. Um, we traveled to Boston, uh, where we had uh, an audience with an aide to Governor Deval Patrick and encouraged him to take a stronger stand against nuclear power and against Pilgrim 
uh, uh, Pil the Pilgrim Reactor in particular. Uh, also visited the Assistant Attorney General, who was, um, you know, concerned, the Attorney General in Massachusetts, Martha Coakley, is concerned about nuclear safety. Not, well, they're not exactly about the existence of nuclear reactors, but more about nuclear safety. So those people need to get nudged along a little bit. Uh, the walk continued on to Pilgrim uh, in southeastern Mass. There was a big rally and vigil, and about 100 people showed up for that. The walk continued to the Cape and on through uh, Rhode Island into Worcester. And at each place, we learned a great deal about what local communities were doing, what they were interested in. It seems as though the farther we got away from nuclear power plants, the less the, you know, the focus of the people we met with was on nuclear power, but more on community issues. So it seems like proximity to a nuclear plant increases anxiety and interest and um, <coughs> activism. And um, we've met some fabulous people doing fabulous work on this walk, and um, it's been great fun. That. But so we started on uh, March 2nd um, at Oyster Creek. It's a nuclear facility on the Jersey Shore. It's about 60 miles south of New York City, about 60 miles uh, east uh, of Philadelphia. It's, uh, it's actually the oldest nuclear reactor in the country right now, and it's, it's in the running for being the oldest continuously running nuclear reactor in the world. Uh, it was built in 1969. Um, it's got the same Mark I containment structure as uh, most of the reactors at Fukushima Daiichi. Uh, we were very lucky, lucky to connect with uh, the Jersey Shore Nuclear Watch, people down there who, um, a group of activists who have been working literally since the early 70s to shut it down, uh, and also to connect with another group, Save Barnegat Bay. Barnegat Bay is the body of water that that, that reactor sits on. 2% of the total water in Barnegat Bay is cycled through the reactor every day. It's a ecological disaster and uh, for many reasons they're, they're working hard to shut it down. So that was, that was, that was also good for us because, uh, because the Peace Walks haven't gone through there so much in the past so hopefully we're making some connections to, um, to other activist communities uh, connecting their local struggle to the to the larger struggle to uh, to shut these plants down. Uh, we walked up the Jersey Shore um, uh, across Staten Island uh, into Manhattan. We were very lucky in Manhattan to, uh, particularly lucky in Manhattan, and I think for, for me one of the interesting things about about walking this spring uh, after the whole Occupy phenomenon was to see sort of what connections could be made or what sort of new bridges could be built or just whether it would be different now that now that the idea of sort of, of people taking to the streets and taking sort of re reoccupying public space to see whether that would be different and in in Manhattan we were really really lucky to be joined to to get a lot of support from the environmental solidarity working group at Occupy Wall Street uh, so we, we started from Zuccotti Park uh, we were also joined by a group of Fukushima evacuees, mothers and children, who walked with us. Uh, and we were something like 70 strong walking from Zuccotti Park to the United Nations. So, you know, when you've been walking, like just a group of like 10 or 15 walkers on like empty roads in the middle of New Jersey with cars whizzing past, and all of a sudden you look back and you're, it stretches, you know, a whole city block. That's like a very, uh, very nice feeling. Um, we, we were also very lucky uh, from that point on to connect with the activists who are working to shut down Indian Point, uh, which is the nuclear facility uh, 30 miles north of New York City, uh, a nuclear facility that has 20 million people living in the 50 mile radius. Um, some large percentage of those people living on islands, uh, just making the evacuation you know, a total fantasy. Uh, and a very committed group of activists who have been doing this for a long time and are very organized. Um, and they, they, they were very on board from the beginning to, to work with us to organize a series of programs around, around the week of Fukushima commemorating that event, uh, including bringing some folks over from Japan. Uh, 
maybe particularly interesting in terms of strategy was something they did to reach out to first responders uh, to bring over people from Japan who had first-hand experience dealing with uh, dealing with the crisis in Fukushima from a first responder point of view uh, and trying to organize meetings with uh, firemen, paramedics, police in the Hudson Valley who would have to do that same work, uh, God forbid, should something happen in, at Indian Point. Um, I want to briefly mention one, one gentleman from Japan who joined us for a couple presentations uh, at, at our nightly potlucks, uh, who's really, um, really an inspiration, a guy named Saburo Kitajima, who, uh, who is actually working as a cleanup worker at Fuku Fukushima Daiichi, and uh, he's a uh, he, he was a nuclear activist uh, back, I think, in the 70s and 80s, and the way he put it, which was totally heartbreaking and kind of mind-blowing at the same time, uh, was that he felt that as an activist he did not work hard enough, and he was not able to prevent these nuclear plants, and so his working as a cleanup worker at Fukushima Daiichi now is a kind of, I guess, atonement, you could call it. But he's also a union organizer and uh, doing a lot to organize the precariat workers uh, a lot of the people working in Fukushima Daiichi are the kind of the, the lowest of the low, the people who have no other options, no other alternatives, um, and people who are receiving their five-year dose of radiation in a month or two. So, um, so he's trying to organize them, to mobilize them. So it was very, very meaningful and inspiring to have him, uh, to have him join us and to, uh, to walk with us and to speak at our events. Um, yeah, this yeah. people of that generation, his generation, yeah. Mr. Kitajima, shares sort of same, you know, feeling of that uh, guilt oh. um, for new generations. Mm. Yeah, and actually, as we did learn that as a result of his, he, there was an article. Maybe some of you saw it in the New York Times about Mr. Kitajima. Uh, and so major media picked up on that, and we learned that as a result of his whistleblowing activities in the United States, uh, he had lost his job, and the company, had, the company that he works for, which contracts with TEPCO to do cleanup, had lost its contract. So, um, so he was uh, took a very courageous stand to be with us. Um, he, he also, I'm sorry, yeah. he also spoke at uh, Democracy Now. Yeah. Little yeah. Section, um, he was on Democracy Now! the Monday, uh, March 12th. Um, yeah. And uh, I think that's basically what I wanted to say. Does someone want to say a little bit about the Hudson Valley? Because then the walk, I had to go back to work, but the walk continued up the Hudson Valley. Um, any? Roberto? Roberto, yeah, sure. Forrest, or? If someone else wants it. Sorry. In White Plains and had a vigil outside of their regional office. I think actually their headquarters, headquarters is down in Louisiana, right? Yeah. In New Orleans. Yeah. Um, and I had a good experience walking around with Forrest, uh, handing out flyers in downtown White Plains. Um, and Uh, I don't know. The, the experience of walking around and sometimes running into folks who were working at Entergy and handing them flyers and they kind of smiled and, yeah, we know, uh, but they took the flyers anyway, which I found very interesting. Um, and going by construction workers who had the same question, well, what are you going to do without nuclear power? Uh, and I would try to say something funny about like using my heart's energy or something like that. <laughs> and, um, so, I don't know, for, for us as young folks involved with this, um, trying to have like a vision of the future is something that I continuously am coming up against. And it, it's a constant question. Um, and so I feel like th this has especially been a theme in urban areas that we've walked through. Um, generally, and after we left White Plains, we headed north into the northern Hudson Valley. Less people are on the street, more people are in their cars. We had less opportunities to receive those questions and to try to think of something in response. Um, and so the next couple days, I actually was sick, um, but we were walking from Hudson, New York, up to Albany, 
and stayed at a Quaker meeting house there. On the way, stayed at a house of a really wonderful woman who wasn't there actually, but she let us stay in her house anyway. Um, and once we got to Albany, we prepared um, a presentation of, or a gift of peace cranes that a German woman had made and sent to us. She made a thousand paper origami peace cranes. And so the next day, we walked down to the Capitol, to the State Building, to make a, an offering to Governor Andrew Cuomo, who was not there. Um, but several people in our group had a wonderful interaction with a police officer who guided them through the building mm -hmm. and, and took them up, um, and was very interested himself in this issue. Um, so I, I feel like we've been surprised along the way by who actually um, is willing to listen. And sometimes I think I, I very much so take for granted the folks who are who, are, uh, who, are who I expect to receive us. Um, and, and so wonderful, especially as a young person, trying to have some perspective on where this is going to go and what we're actually achieving. If, you know, if we are going to stop something or uh, if it's more so just about the process that we're doing, if we're really doing this to try to get to know each other and build community and find peace within ourselves. Um, so I think these little moments of, of folks who, who really open up to us and ask us what we're doing, I think, is, has really helped. Um, especially feeling tired at the end of a walk. Um, so the next morning, um, we held a vigil at, in Niskayuna at Knowles Atomic Energy or Power Center, um, which produces small reactors for nuclear su or atomic submarines, um, and stood out for an hour in front of the gate as workers were driving in. Um, and at one point, a security guard came out with his digital camera and was taking pictures of us. Uh, and I instinctively like put my banner over my face, <laughs> trying to you know pr protect myself in some superficial way. Um, but uh, kind of at, in that moment, understanding like as soon as I signed up for this walk, I took some risk, um, and so then slowly guiltily loading the banner, <laughs> and realizing like everyone else is just as implicated, um, and thus becoming more aware of myself with respect to the group, and knowing that it's not just about me. You know, the people I love who are standing down the road for me are also being photographed. Um, and some of the folks have been photographed for years endlessly. And they're definitely on many different types of, types of lists. <laughs> uh, so I, I think this experience for me has been really important in terms of learning to grow up a little bit. Um, and whether we shut down a nuclear power plant or not. Uh, and, and really, I think, spending time with folks my age and a lot of folks who are older who have been doing this for a while, coming into this movement thinking, all these people, they don't know what they're doing, I'm going to do it right. Um, <laughs> and, and then understanding that it's not so much about that, it's in the end actually trying to do it together, I think. Um, so... I think for me, emotionally, that, that's what's been going on. It's been really wonderful to share this with all of you and then come together as an even bigger group now and be almost 30 people um, and feel that dynamic. And especially the energy as we're walking along the street and seeing how far we can stretch. Um, so thank you. You know, you can't always just be calling for an end to something. You also have to be doing something constructively together. So, you know, walking together is learning how to build a community and, and sort of training for building a movement. And I just wanted to mention that we, you know, we had some, we had these very positive interactions with the Indian Point uh, activists. And they, they now are doing a, what they call a convergence, which is a monthly gathering which happens down at the Stony Point Center uh, in the lower Hudson Valley near Indian Point. And the goal of that, when they started, was to bring together all the different groups which, for their various reasons, were working to shut down Indian Point. And they've had a lot of success in terms of bringing them together once a month and kind of having like a global uh, brainstorming, strategizing session, and a lot of very effective uh, techniques uh, and actions have come out of that. Uh, one of the nice things about the walk was that in the planning for the walk, we were able to bring the Jersey Shore people up 
to that meeting and sort of connect those two struggles. But I, I just want to put that out there for any of you who are involved in the in the struggle to shut down Vermont Yankee. That 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 may be an interesting thing to keep on your radar in terms of. I know the the people in New York were very excited about our walk to Vermont, uh, and I think are are hoping to learn a lot from your struggle in Vermont because they may be going. They're, it's, they're gearing up to go through a very similar thing, and it may come down to some of the same issues, state versus federal and that sort of thing. So keep, keep that in mind. Oh, oh just Seabrook and Pilgrim? Seabrook and Pilgrim? But Vermont yeah. Yankee is okay, like well, right, up, right up the street. All right, let's do it, girl. All right. Um, so, well, where should we start? Well, we can start with Seabrook because we were there first. Yeah. So we went to this program at the library, the public library, that was so great, like George said. <laughs> and um, we were, I was, I was really shocked about what I heard. Um, uh, right, so Seabrook uh, was built in a marsh. Um, and actually our, our assistant attorney general, Matthew Brock, that we met, um, was in a battle to prevent that from happening. Um, maybe he had a little more foresight than the people who built Seabrook in a marsh uh, because now, as it turns out, and as the NRC has disclosed in public documents, the foundation at Seabrook, which was built um, out of a certain kind of concrete, has crumbled, has begun to crumble. Not only has it begun to crumble, but it has undergone moderate to severe damage, and that's a direct quote from the NRC public document. Um, actually, it's uh, eroded 22% in the 20 years that it's been operational. Um, and as with uh, Vermont Yankee and Pilgrim and all of the Fukushima uh, reactors and every Mach 1 boiling water reactor from General Electric, as all these reactors are, the, uh, most of the infrastructure in terms of running the plant and all of the wiring and the piping for the backup systems is in the basement. Mm -hmm. um, so any failings of this concrete foundation that has been eroded by the alkaline marsh um, will lead to uh, power outages and failings of the backup systems. It's also very, very costly to replace or to fix. Um, not only that, but uh, when they began to build it in the marsh, there was supposed to be a protective membrane around the cement to keep this erosion from happening. Um, but it was damaged in the installation, and it's never been required to be replaced or updated in any way. Um, the NRC has never enforced this, never actually even asked, let alone enforced after the asking, um, energy to fix this. So we have that. Um, what else? There, there's actually leaks um, in and out of the tunnels that have the electrical wiring and the piping, and to fix that, and, or to try to allay fears of uh, possible damage being done to the infrastructure by this water, Entergy has um, started pumping it out, um, pumping it out into the ocean, um, over 30,000 gallons of water per day. And all of this water uh, has a special isotope of hydrogen called tritium, um, so this water is referred to as tritiated water, and they're pumping it offshore, but you know how the ocean is, that spreads that stuff everywhere. And it's coming back. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, and also not only that, they're, they're pulling in over 500 million gallons of water a day from the Atlantic Ocean and putting nearly that much back um, to, like, do their whole cooling process. Um, also radioactive. They're also, uh, and that's, that's a problem that's common with, in the three reactors in our region. Um, everybody knows that they're doing that. It's on public record. Also, they have routine... Uh, steam releases, also with tritiated steam from their water circulation system t in order to release pressure. Do um, you have anything to add about Seabrook? Problem that's specific to Seabrook, but as Annie mentioned, there's problems that are common themes. And, oh yeah, thanks. And just like Christian had mentioned that they were pulling in 2% of the bay's water every day, that's, I bet that's a comparable number to that 530 it was 543 million gallons. Thank you. 543 million gallons getting pumped yeah. in every single day and then getting pumped out. And in the meantime, and so this is common to all the all the reactors, whether it's ocean or river. And so the aquatic life is getting destroyed. Eggs, larvae, fish is all getting 
pumped in, destroyed, and then pumped out, tradiated. So that's common to all the ones that we're talking about. The other thing that's common to all the reactors that we're talking about, but we're, we're talking about specifically Pilgrim and Seabrook, but also Vermont Yankee too, is that there's four times as many spent fuel rods it's stored on the premises than was originally allotted for, and they just keep putting more and more in. This is so high risk, it's so da dangerous. The amount of spent fuel rods that are in, I believe it's Vermont Yankee, is four times more than all we're, of them, all, all, of them. all of them, yeah. each one of them that each has one four. of them has four times as much spent fuel as it was designed to have, and all of those are more than all of the Fukushima reactors, um, reactors that melted combined. down. Oh so it's like we've got so much more danger happening. And there's certain, there certain, in Vermont Yankee and in Pilgrim, they're stored above ground in a really ridiculously flimsy container with a tin roof on it. They're stored, they're stored on the roof of the reactor. Yeah. In, and so if in a pool that's 40 by 40 by 40, and like there's a tin roof on it, the kind that you find in a warehouse. Mm -hmm. And if you remember the kind of damage that happened in Springfield last summer with that tornado, I mean, it tore warehouse roofs off. Yeah. So just to, I'm just kind of like pulling it in. So we have faulty things done on installation. We have faulty things that are happening that the NRC isn't paying attention to. Then we have the deliberate discharge of tritiated water. Then we have the deliberate intake of half a million gallons a day and dis destruction of aquatic life. Five hundred billion. billion. Yeah, 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 half a billion. Yeah. But then also we have the output. Hmm of um, thermally hot water. So just keeping up, like now we're onto that. We're onto thermally hot water. That's being discharged at all the reactor plants that we're talking about, the three that were up in our neck of the woods, Pilgrim, Seabrook, and Vermont Yankee. And actually, we had a woman come from the Watershed Coalition. She was fantastic, and she spoke yesterday about how that water has affected the population of one of the fish. I don't know if it was Shad. Somebody help me. Sturgeon. Sturgeon. 99% decreased since Vermont Yankee started doing that. And that's true for all of them. They're all putting thermally hot water in. And one of the things she said is, geez, think about the difference in temperature that one degree can make for aquatic life, for marine life. We're talking about 15 degrees difference. Water, warm water, not where it's put out, but 50 miles down the river in Holyoke. So that's how powerful the warm water is. You know what? They could cool that water. They could cool that water and send it through the tanks, but they won't do it. Why? Money. Money. So they're not. So this is an organization, the NRC is an organization that it's difficult to trust. Two fifty. Wait, Tony. Like, why? What? What? What's the process? Okay. Old or what? What happens? Well, I can. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about the mechanics of um, the lab one uh, boiling water reactor from GE. Uh, the way it works is, um, it's it's fuel or powered by nuclear fission, and so um, like atoms of uranium, uh, well, atoms of a certain isotope of uranium that have been concentrated down from the uranium that was like mined out of the land. Um, uh, by the way, as Vanessa will talk about, it's a very harmful process. And then after all said and done, and it is mined out of the land, after it's refined, 99% of that uranium is unusable um, because it's not pure enough. And so 1% is used for nuclear reactors and bombs. And then the other 99% is just waste. And as Beth is fond of pointing out, that waste is then sold back to the government, which uses it um, on the tips of bullets and um, tank-piercing missiles and other dirty um, bombs. Um, anyway, so then the uranium is they arranged. They call it depleted uranium, but it right. isn't But it's still very, very radioactive. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then uh, it's arranged on these columns of um, certain metals, and this metal is called clotting because it like clots it together. And so there are these very long, like rather skinny columns. Maybe they have like, um, something, maybe like six inches in diameter. And it's just like uranium up and down. And then um, these columns are stuck in a tank of water because the clotting is very, very, very flammable, by the way. It's not the uranium, it's the clotting, just extremely flammable. And um, so it needs to be kept cool all the time and it needs to be submerged in water, which is perfect for the system because um, as you'll find out, like, it's stuck in this pool of water, um, the uranium is then bombarded with other atoms, and <coughs> um, fission happens, and so it releases a great quantity of energy, the water that's surrounding it is evaporated, the, the steam goes up, and what does it do? It turns turbines to generate electricity. So we're basically creating the steam engine over again in a very, very dangerous and expensive <laughs> way. 
Um, and not only that, but you can stick uh, a windmill up in the air and it will turn a turbine. And uh, it will turn that turbine all day. And you don't need nuclear fission to do that at all. I just want to say two things. One, um, somebody said over here that plutonium was in it. Plutonium is, remains radioactive for 250,000 years. Yeah. So just let's think about that. And there's actually, if you have a chance before you leave, please check out the um, posters that Brother Kanida did. He, he got these out of a, a common publication in Japan. These are the kinds of things that are printed in Japan. And it has a list of cesium, strontium, plutonium, how long it stays radioactive, and where you find it in your body. So if you have a chance, please do look at that. And let's and um, let's see, the other thing I wanted to mention was the positive part. There are big wind farms that are getting sponsored. sponsored. Google is partnering in um, other nations, and they're saying, let's go wind. And there was, um, help me you guys, the name of the German company, Siemens. Siemens, was nuclear. It had a lot of enormous reactors. They are going to be closing them. They have a plan for closing them over time, and they're putting their investments into um, into wind and renewable energy. So the game is on and the tide is turning. Just want it to turn faster. Speaking of the tide, uh, we learned it up in Amesbury when we were at Seabrook that uh, Bath Ironworks, which had been making destroyers, is uh, partnering with the University of Maine <coughs> through a federal grant to create offshore wind turbines. So uh, there is hope around the corner. We're working on that. And um, I wanted to give you a few concepts about the whole nuclear fuel cycle being, uh, the whole cycle from beginning to end as being uh, the wrong direction. Uh, from mining, uh, which ruins uh, native lands and has affected native populations, uh, West particularly, uh, to the actual production of bullets and bombs with uh, this, quote, depleted uranium, um, we're, we don't know. We're really playing with a very dangerous fire because uh, we don't know what the uh, future 20 years hence is going to look like with this kind of uh, destructive potential of even one particle of radiation is damaging to uh, cells and to life. What about um, the concentration of uh, nuclear radiation on uh, day after day on all of life? And so uh, it's a good thing that we're, we're working on this. Um, I did want to talk about Paducah, Kentucky a little bit because it's the only place in the country where this uranium is processed. And the, I did some research in the last couple of days and found out that the fuel uh, that's used, the, the, the release of toxins of CFC-114 is much worse than CO2 for the atmosphere. And um, of course it's in a poor area of the, Kentucky, it wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't be located in Wellesley or Newton or um, Boston, but um, it's in a very poor area of Kentucky, and um, 70 feet high with only a tin roof on the top, as was shared. And there were 2,000 curies of cesium-137 in the atom bomb that uh, exploded at Hiroshima, and that's 2,000 curies of cesium, that's the explosive power of this, of this um, radionucleotide. Nucleoide. Um, there are 35 million curies of cesium in the spent fuel pool at Vermont Yankee. You know, 10 to 37 percent higher rates of cancer, deaths by cancer, around uh, Vermont Yankee and Wyndham County than the rest of Vermont. So we know that radiation is dangerous for people and all living things. And um, I think we, the Wampanoags remind us of how they led our walk in Pilgrim, by the way, the Wampanoags, and we met with them while we were there. And it was uh, lovely that Mother Bear, um, wearing clothes that she had made uh, and decorated and painted, hand painted, uh, led the walk. and. Um, 
the people in of the Wampanoag and the native peoples have been largely exploited by this technology and um, they have answers of how we can live connected with all of life as does Nipponsan Mihoji and so it was a very special occasion to have them leading the walk in Pilgrim. We're just going to know what the plan is. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Annika Corbett. I live in Florence, and I'm with the Shut It Down Affinity Group. Um, we met up in uh, the Graduate School of the Marlboro College today from 11 to 3 and tried to put more of a form on the actions on Thursday the 22nd, which is the first day that the plant should not be operating anymore. Single file march to Entergy headquarters on Old Ferry Road. Um, it's a very dangerous road and there will be peacekeepers and they really encouraged us to be extremely cautious. Um, that said, we did a lot of hashing around of whether there should be an occupation or not, whether there would be arrests or not. Apparently, there had been a liaison with the police. And uh, first, it seemed like they didn't want to arrest people because they have limited manpower and not much space. But then it seems like they are going to do arrests if we go on the property. And um, I think that's all I can think of right now. Ask questions. Yeah, I heard that in the past couple of days, Vermont Yankee has been running um, at 50%. Capacity. Yes. What is going on with that? Apparently, they wanted to have it all bagged, shall we say, with their permit and everything before they did a replacement of some part, which I don't even know the name of the part. Mm -hmm. Instead, they lined the tubes with epoxy. And that has caused, and, and most of these Mark I uh, reactors have already replaced this part after 30 years, mm -hmm. but they have not. And apparently the epoxy inside of the tubes is causing a back pressure, so they have to slow down. Oh, okay. What's interesting to me is that every time they slow down, they owe the grid $10 million. So it's to our advantage, actually, that this thing messed up. Although, maybe not. <laughs> so um, they are now working at putting out less power. You know, is anybody projecting how long that will last or what's going to happen? They are waiting for their public, what is it, the public commission to give them their certificate of public good. And that hasn't happened yet. How could that happen if they're experiencing a serious malfunction and put epoxy <laughs> on in the inside of these pipes without Don't ask me. To know what it's going to do. That right. Cheap. It's crazy. So, Annika, how many people are we expecting at uh I'm not sure, but Entergy. I heard a number of 500, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's more. I'd be thrilled if it was more. Um and then, you know, there are those people who want to do civil disobedience and those who do not, and we're trying to make it all work for everybody and have support people so that if people are taken away, far away, which there are questions about, um, the support people will be able to follow them and bring them back home. Any other questions? At 8.30 a.m., and it will start from right here. And, what time to, and we will walk um, out through Route 9 to Amherst and then turning north up Maple and over 63 to Mount Toby Meeting House where we'll have our program tomorrow uh, evening. So what, 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 what the, the, this, this year, the, the Walk for a New Spring uh -huh. that you do every year, you said this year it's really more significant than usual because of the accident at Fukushima. Well, and yeah, yes, um, this year we, we, our focus of the walk is nuclear power. And, uh, because of the accident last year in, in Japan, to Fukushima, we couldn't not do the, uh, this 
work uh, focusing on the nuclear power. That's what that means. Sister Claire from the Peace Pagoda, and, and you're talking about this particular walk, Claire. Yes, um, I think it's been a powerful walk, spiritually powerful and, and informationally powerful. We, we have learned so much. We try to be people who help to share information with each community and learn more. We've learned a lot. We've shared a lot. Um, it's unmistakable, though, that this the feeling we have that this moment in time is itself very powerful, very important, very powerful. There is a stirring and awakening happening. Um, I think in, in terms of, uh, you know, the nuclear reactors, it's tied a lot with the, the incredible catastrophe of Fukushima. This has spoken to people's souls, you know, despite what the may, media may or may not cover. Um, it's, it, it, people are, something very deep is happening. We found in communities near the reactors, in some of the reactors in New England, where it's been very tough to get, you know, anything kind of going. Um, you know, a hundred people have walked in the streets that have never gone outside their front door before. It's, it's something. This is a very important moment. And we need... Um, we need to stay, keep our hearts and consciousness very aware and very moving with this moment. You know, that's all we can keep doing and staying together with all our brothers and sisters in this much larger awakening and, and uh, moving forward. I do believe we can somehow prevail um, and shut down these nuclear reactors. I really do. The, the universe the divine, you know, life force, the goodness and care and love of humanity is all, you know, conspiring together. You can really feel it. Thank you.